Welcome to Trinity Church. As always, it's a delight to have an opportunity to worship with you today. And if you are visiting with us for the very first time, we want to say an extra special welcome to you. We hope that you're going to enjoy uh, your time here and then feel the love of Jesus through the hospitality of this place called Trinity and that you'll come back and visit us again really soon. Today is the day that Operation Christmas Child Shoeboxes are due. However, if you happen to forget, you can get them to us by noon tomorrow, by noon central. You have to have those turned in because they are going on to the next step tomorrow uh, afternoon. So make sure you get those in and we will bless uh, kids all over the world this year with those boxes. Also, we're just around the corner from Hanging of the Greens, which is on November 26th, the last uh, Sunday of Thanksgiving break. And that is where we will gather at 4 o'clock in the afternoon to decorate the entire campus for Christmas. It's going to be a wonderful afternoon together. And, of course, we will celebrate uh, when it's all done by eating pancakes and bacon. So we want to invite you to come and be a part of that. There should be an insert in your bulletin uh, last week and this week that you can check off where you would like to serve and how many people will be coming so we have enough food prepared for you. Also, lastly, right now, we are collecting cookies. Uh, if you will, want to bake some cookies, buy some cookies, bring them to the church, drop them off in the kitchen with a note that says uh, Victorian Front Porch Tour, and we'll put those aside uh, for this great event that we have the, the great opportunity uh, to be right here where it begins and ends. And we want to welcome people onto our campus and let them experience the hospitality and love of Jesus through us. Uh, so bring those cookies in. We would greatly appreciate it. And that's all for today. But before we get back into worship, let's check in with Hannah and Leanne for this week's Trinity Kids in Preschool Moments. much fun singing for the Trinity Troopers Thanksgiving lunch last week. Thursday, we'll have our preschool Thanksgiving brunch with our parents and grandparents. And on Friday, we will celebrate Mickey Mouse's birthday. The color for the month is orange, the shape for the month is rectangle, and the theme for November is Thanksgiving. Our Bible story focus is, I can thank God for friends. The memory verse for November is always give thanks to God, Ephesians 5.20. And now let's go to Hannah for this week's Trinity Kids moment. Good morning, Trinity Kids. In week two, we head to 2 Samuel chapter six, where we find King David in a powerful moment in Israel's history. David had the privilege of bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. He was so overwhelmed with gratitude and excitement that he danced and celebrated. David was willing to make himself look foolish to worship God for being faithful to the Israelites. The bottom line is celebrate what God has done. Just like King David took time to thank God for being faithful, we pray that you will learn to do the same. God has done so much for us. God will continue to show us love and faithfulness in the future and deserve all of our gratitude. We pray that you will take time to celebrate and offer thanks to God. I hope you have a great Sunday and I look forward to seeing you soon.
I invite you to remain standing for the reading of God's holy word. Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. There's a true story that comes from the sinking of the Titanic. A frightened woman was placed in her lifeboat, and as it was about to be lowered into the raging raging Atlantic Ocean, she suddenly thought of something in her stateroom that she desperately needed, and she asked permission to return to her stateroom before they cast off. She was granted three minutes, they said. We'll give you three minutes, or we will leave without you. She ran across the deck, which was already dangerously tilted and at a dangerous angle, and she ran through the gambling room with all the money, which had been rolled up on the deep, ankle deep worth of money. She came to the stateroom and quickly pushed aside the diamond rings and the expensive bracelets and expensive necklaces, and she reached in the shelf above the bed, and she grabbed Three small oranges. She quickly found her way back to the light boat and she got in. Now that seems incredible because 30 minutes earlier, she would not have chosen a crate full of oranges for the smallest or tiniest of diamonds. But death had boarded the Titanic. And one blast of its awful breath had transformed all values. Instantaneously, priceless things had become worthless. And worthless things had become priceless. At that moment, she preferred three small oranges over a crate of diamonds. There are events in life which have the power to transform the way we see the world. Jesus' parable here about the ten virgins offers one of these types of events for the, the parable is about the second coming of Christ. But Jesus doesn't come right out and say this. Rather, he lets the story uh, tell it for him. The, the woman on the sinking Titanic understood that in light of her cir- current circumstances that she must make preparations, if necessary, for living for some time on a lifeboat. Diamonds would not suffice. Only the precious resources of the orange were good enough. Likewise, in this world, Christ may return at any moment, and the parable warns us that we must be ready. Weddings are one of these kinds of events. 
any time I, I perform a wedding, I always admonish the wedding party to, to be ready, <laughs> to make a special effort, to show up early or at least on time, to, to be dressed and be ready for the, the event that's about to unfold because it's a big day. And most times it works, sometimes it doesn't. But Jesus' parable about the wedding is not told from the standpoint of the bride and bridegroom, but rather of the ten young virgins who are invited to this occasion. Five of them were foolish, the parable describes, and five of them were wise. What was the measure of their wisdom? In a word, their readiness to be part of the event. All of the young women had oil in their lamps, but five of them had an additional supply of oil. This is, of course, foreign to our concepts of modern weddings today. Weddings in our society are designed for a specific time and in a specific place. And if things are late in getting started, you can see those invited. You can see the guests. They begin fidgeting in their seats, don't they? They they begin fidgeting, wondering what's going on. But here in this time, in first century Palestine, a wedding could happen at any time within a period of several days. The uncertainty was part of the excitement of the event. The bridegroom would love to catch the wedding party sleeping, uh, taking a nap, just resting their eyes. But fairness required that announcements had to be made. So just before the event, a messenger would come on the streets shouting, here's the bridegroom, come out and meet him. And the alert ones in the wedding would respond while the others would be left behind. In Jesus' parable, the cry came at midnight. This was often the case. Most bridegrooms would choose to come late at night. The sleeping attendants were awakened, and, and, and it was then that they realized that they did not have enough oil for their lamps to get through the night. Panicked, they attempted to borrow some from the other bridesmaids. But they responded in verse 9, No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go in to those who Sell oil and buy some for yourselves. So the five foolish maidens, they hurried out. But by the time they returned, the doors had already been closed. They knocked and they pleaded to be part of the festivities. And verse 11 says, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he said, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. In other words, if you were meant to be part of the festivities, you'd already be here. If, if you belonged at this event, you would have already been present. So Jesus concludes here in verse 13, Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. What this parable is saying, what it's saying to us, well, let me make a few suggestions. First, I believe it is saying some things in life cannot be borrowed. Some things in life just cannot be borrowed. You and I cannot live on someone else's oil. We can help one another in so many ways, but at some point, we have to provide for ourselves. This is especially true when it comes to our faith. Uh, your parents cannot walk this path for you. Uh, your husbands cannot depend on the devotion of your wives. I've heard it said more than once on several occasions over the years, I've heard it said by a husband, my wife handles the religion in our family. <laughs> what they really reveal, though, is how little they understand about the faith. Faith is a most intense 
personal relationship, a personal experience. It is the most personal experience that we will ever have in this life. Others can help us toward it. They can encourage us. They can pray for us. They can train us up in the way that we should go. But in the end, we must embrace it for ourselves. No one can do that for us. The five foolish maidens in this story were foolish because they thought that they could rely on the resources of others to get them through. And what they discovered was that there are some things in life that simply cannot be borrowed. Secondly, I think this parable teaches us that there are some things that cannot be put off until the last minute. In regard to our property insurance, for example, here at the church, we don't wait until there's a storm brewing in the Gulf of Mexico before we decide that we're going to uh, secure uh, proper insurance. We don't wait until the tornado sirens sound off before we decide that we need to be insured. We don't wait until a fire starts in the kitchen before we decide, hey, we need insurance on this property. Diapers and wipes are something that you can't wait until the last minute to buy. In the 10 seconds that it takes to make a tremendous mess, we have no time to get out and find what we need, right? There are some things that you need to be prepared for. A midterm exam is not something you put off until the last minute. On the morning of the exam, we can't consume two months' worth of knowledge. When it comes to these kind of decisions in our businesses and in our homes, we understand as businessmen and businesswomen, as moms and dads, we all understand that there are some things that you simply cannot put off. Yet, it's amazing to me how many of us fail to grasp this concept when it comes to life's decisions. How many couples I have seen over the years who never darken the, the doorstep of a church. And then they have marital problems and they panic and they rush to the church because they decide that religion may be the last thing they try before they end in divorce. And many people, all the time they wonder why this last ditch effort didn't work for them. Here's what I want to say to you today. My friends, you cannot make withdrawals until you have first made deposits. There are some things that cannot be left until the last moment. There was a family who wanted their pastor to counsel their daughter in a, in a, in a life decision that they, they felt like she was making that was wrong. And so the pastor visited with the daughter for some time. He, he, he spent, you know, uh, she came to his office and she was willing to give him half an hour. And he spent half an hour and he ministered to her and he counseled with her and he spoke with her and he, he did the best that he could to try to lead her in the right direction. But yet she still chose to go contrary to her parents decision afterwards the parents told the pastor that they were quite disappointed that he had not been able to change the mind of their daughter uh, the mother in fact she was quite disappointed and she let it be known to the pastor and she said of all people I thought you would be able to change her mind to which he looked at her candidly and honestly and he says ma'am what am I going to do in 30 minutes that you haven't been willing to do in 30 years? Why is it that we so often put off the important decisions until the last moment? Jesus said that is because we are foolish. It's foolish. It's the foolish person who is not able to look down the long road. It is not the, the, the foolish maidens. It's not that they lacked any desire. They genuinely wanted to go in and to participate in the celebration. It's just that they had insufficient forethought into how that was to happen. All too often, we believe that heaven can wait. And yet, 
It is the wise person who does not put off matters of eternity until the last moment. Thirdly, that if we are not prepared, we can miss out on great opportunities. The issue here is one of readiness when Christ returns. I, I, I found this ex extraordinarily uh, relevant here in, because in, in recent weeks with, with all that is going on in Israel, I can't tell you how many people have asked me, do you think that the world is coming to an end? Do you think that Christ is going to return? To which my answer is, if you think it's going to happen, it probably isn't because the scripture is clear that we do not know. We cannot know. We will not know. What I know today is that we are a day closer today than we were yesterday. And so what we need to do is we need to make sure that we prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls for when that day comes, we are prepared. We are ready. Because when God holds his grand celebration, the question is, will we be ready? Now I'll be the first one to admit to you that over the years this theme has been abused by many preachers in many pulpits. But there is a genuine component to this theology. We need to understand that there is an element of judgment in this parable. There is. When the foolish maidens arrived at the party, we are told in verse 10 that the door was shut. The door was shut. And when I read this, I cannot help but to think of the story of, of Noah. When he gathered his family into the ark, when the great flood came and many pounded on the door and they begged to be let into the ark, the scripture says clearly, the door was shut. Exact same phraseology. There are metaphors here for God's judgment. And they remind us that the door that God shuts, no man can open. Most of you are familiar with former, oh, I imagine most or all of you are familiar with former governor George Wallace. And before he died, he openly admitted that when he stood on the steps before the University of Alabama and denied entrance to black students, that he was wrong. He even openly apologized for that action. And I affirm that change of mind in him. Yet in that moment, in that time, when his great moment in history came, he missed his great opportunity. Charles Colson uh, repented of his infamous Watergate affair, and, and after prison, he spent the rest of his life in service of Christian work. He authored books, and he advocated for prison reform. His conversion was truly a genuine one. Bill Clinton, for some, was considered to be a pre great president by many. But even for many who support him, they cannot deny that in his great moment in history, he disgraced the presidency with his actions. It has been said by many detractors and supporters that he is still in search of his legacy. The tragedy, to some degree, will always be there. When his great history, when his great moment in history came, he was not mentally or morally prepared for it, and he missed it. Oh, the tragedy of missed opportunities. Jesus is telling us in this simple parable about the tragedy of an unprepared life. Jesus said that we are at all times to be prepared for no one knows the hour. My friends, the best way to be prepared for tomorrow is to be ready today. A time will come when no further preparation is possible. 
I went to visit a, visit a woman before her surgery. And just before her surgery, she said to me, she says, Pastor, if everything turns out all right, that'll be okay. And if everything doesn't turn out all right, that'll be okay too. What she was speaking was in the language of the five virgins. She's prepared to live and she's prepared to die. The scripture says that the bridegroom was a long time in going and they all became drowsy and they fell asleep. And at midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come and meet him. Those maidens were prepared. The maidens that were prepared, Jesus called wise. Could the same be said about you? As followers of Christ, we must heed the message of this parable and take it to heart. We are called to be vigilant and watchful and prepared for the second coming of our Lord. We must ensure that our spiritual lamps are burning brightly and they are fueled by the Holy Spirit. This means cultivating a deep and personal relationship with Jesus, spending time in prayer and studying his word and living a life that reflects his teachings. The parable of the ten virgins reminds us that our Lord will, he will return at an unexpected hour. Let us not get caught off guard, but rather like the five wise virgins who were prepared, let us be ready. Many, may we be filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit shining brightly as a testimony of our faith in Jesus Christ. Let us live each day with a sense of urgency, knowing that our eternal destiny relies upon our preparedness. May we be found faithful when the bridegroom returns. And may we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servants. Praise be to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.